Welcome everyone to another episode of my podcast and as uh, my regular listeners always know I'm always delighted to um, have new guests on and today is no different. Today I've got the brilliant Bowen Moody on today. Say hello Bowen. Hey everyone. Uh, Bowen is the CEO and co-founder of Wonderway, which is the first time I've uh, come across this uh, this uh, organisation. One of your uh, colleagues reached out to me and suggested that I should get you uh, get you on. So here we are. Well, I've done a little bit of high level digging, but as my regular listeners know, these are off the cuff. It's kind of we go we go where it is. However, um, it is ChatGPT because we always want to talk about ChatGPT. But more around, I'm going to get this wrong. Um, kind of real time coaching for your sales reps based on their. Um, sales calls and all clever tech stuff like that. However, before we get into that, as always, I start with the uh, Bowen, the who, what, why, when, where. Let's hear your story and see whichever rabbit hole we go down to go down today. Thanks, Alexander. Um, yeah, so my story is that uh, at Wonderway we built sales training software and we have for the last four years. Um, we've been building basically a sales LMS um, and focusing on correlating the um, impact on the training against conversion rates and revenue um, from data that we're pulling out of the CRM. So this is something we've been working on for the last few years. And we just released a new product, which is an AI call coach, which basically listens in on the calls and gives uh, reps feedback on how they're performing on each of their calls. So in terms of the the, the journey of how we got there, I think, um, you know, as we were working on the LMS, we were able to look at what training was happening and we were able to look at what the conversion rates and revenue impact was and make the correlations. But there was always this question from our customers around what was the behavioral change that was happening in the middle. So if a training has happened, taken place, um, are we actually able to see people's performance changing and, and what is then the impact? And it was always the missing piece of the puzzle that we weren't able to answer. Um, so when ChatGPT was released and large language models have sort of taken off in the last few months, um, we saw this as an opportunity to actually now be able to listen into calls, um, start looking at behaviors, what people are saying to, to close that gap. So um, that was really what led us to the idea. And, and we've now been working on the product for around five months. So it's still very, very, very early for us. Um, we're actually just coming out of beta, but I think we've we've really been pushing the limits on what ChatGPT and large language models can do here from a coaching perspective. Um, so yeah, happy to, to share sort of what we've learned so far and where we think it can take, where we think it can go. Awesome. So tell me then, how does a product manager from a shipping organization end up <laughs> doing real time coaching with uh, with Chat GPT? That's a that's an interesting. Yeah, one. if you want the <laughs> if you want the full story, it's it's a bit more complicated. I mean, I'm also Australian um, now, living in Germany, previously working in Denmark. So I've kind of my career's been bouncing around a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, how did I go from there? So. I, after working as a product manager in a shipping company in Denmark, then I uh, then I got into startups. So I actually started a company um, with a with a friend. Um, we raised some like early pre seed money, but we weren't able to find uh, product market fit. But at that pro- at that time, I guess I was operating as a product manager with a friend who's a developer, um, and started learning all things sales as part of that process. So basically, self taught um, to bring on the first customers, uh, and then yeah, when that didn't work out, then actually started another company, which was a, a company-wide training product. And mm-hmm. that time we also raised the money and got more traction. We got up to you know, a, a reasonable number of customers. And I think I went really deep into the sales space then. Um, and then when that didn't work out either, then um, and I said, okay, I'm, I've learned so much about sales and, and I can see that there's a big pain point here because I, I taught myself, I read a lot of stuff online. It was a lot of trial and error. Um, speaking to a lot of you know senior experienced salespeople, and I, I kind of just realized that everyone's done it the same way. Everyone's just kind of figuring it out for themselves. I mean, I was so insecure at the beginning that I didn't know what I was doing, and the more yeah. people I spoke to realized that they didn't know what they were doing either, or it was a lot of trial and error. Um, you know, of course, some companies, some people are lucky to large, or land in a large organization where they can get trained from the scratch. But um, so many companies, like even if you're in a big company, doesn't necessarily mean they're giving you real training. Um, there's a lot of a lot of companies still just focus on you know the internal staff, their product, their customers, their processes. But you know, very very few organizations still, I think, are really training salespeople on on basic sales skills. So um, I think it's a clear opportunity was then and it still is now. I believe it definitely hasn't been solved. Um, but yeah, so that's the long story of how I got here. I think I think, and also kudos to to you for you know giving it a go for for a third time. You know, you, you tried it once, didn't quite work out. Tried it again, 
didn't quite work out and here you are almost five years five years in now into into wonderway i've looked at the website you know pretty decent stable of, uh, of logos on there from a uh from a from a client perspective um so you know starting out from that learning management system lms that's what learning management systems um from from a sales perspective and i think that not i think i also know that that's a tr- anybody in sales knows that sales is hard work and you have to persist you know you've got to take the rough with the um rough with the smooth and i i also believe is the more senior one gets you realize that a lot of people you know are kind of not making it up on the fly but we are learning as we're um uh, as we're going and it's interesting that you you mentioned kind of getting back to basics i had david jp fisher on a uh podcast recently uh who's now social selling sales management lead at um sas uh, software and then we were talking then about actually fundamentally certainly in sas sales are are we over engineering the technology and over engineering the the science of it for those listening i'm doing my inverted commas versus actually the basic premise of what selling is and my my instinct is that yes we are if you look at the narrative that is out there in terms of the science of the uh, the the open rates the email um subject lines the email length the email this the that the if you're using video all these different things it seems to be very much focused on on the the science and the technology not necessarily the uh, you know, i know this gets kind of bandied around as, as a term but the, the client experience or the user experience at, at, at the other end and you said you listened to you know my my previous guest uh, seth from forrester and my concern at the moment with all things chat gpt and, and and related is that are we just going to create more of the same but it's ai generated versus um more you know personalization at scale that you 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 can't do so i know that's not quite where we will go to where we want to get to but just in that backdrop around you know what you've seen in the last five you said you're working on product for five months in terms of the explosion in all of this what narrative are you seeing more broadly before we kind of double down into into what you you're building okay so there's quite a lot in that question i mean um, (laughs) but maybe uh yeah i mean the maybe just starting with the point that you made around you know art versus science and and you know maybe over engineering things so i think um when it comes to like sales basics when it comes to art versus science i mean our philosophy as a company is that you know we do focus more on the the science perspective because i think you know we're, we're, we've got a training background and i think you can train process you can train technique yeah. you can train um you can train these things i think then there's also the art side where some people are just naturally better with people better at active listening have kind of softer people skills and that's harder to teach in my in my opinion um, it's harder to teach these things and therefore as a sales training company, we don't spend as much time on it because it's harder to move the needle there. Whereas yeah. I think when it comes to the, the process and the science, this is something that, you know, there's tons of data out there. There's tons of research that's been done, um, you know, trying to distill that into something that somebody can understand and helping them to apply that is where we see a, a bigger opportunity. Um, and yeah, I think there's, there's so much stuff already out there, but then it's just hard to break through all the noise. Um, and I think the, the opportunity with AI maybe is, is in two areas. I think you already mentioned it. So personalization is a big, is a big thing. So taking all of that information, but then being able to funnel it down into something that's relevant for that, that individual person. Um, and when it comes to over engineering, like the science of, of, you know, revenue teams and revenue organizations, I think sometimes this does seem way too complicated sometimes, but, uh, it depends on the size of the organization. So. Um, for a small team, like for us, you know, we're, we've been in this startup world for the last couple of years. Um, most of the stuff, like the forecasting tools and revenue predictions and stuff, this is completely irrelevant for a company our size. Yeah. Of course, like we can just speak to the, the account executives and get a, a good enough feel on what's happening in the business. Yeah. But when we do speak to some of our customers who have sales teams of 500 people plus, um, you know, I understand why there's, why there's so many of these tools that are being developed because once you get over a t- sales team size of 50 or you know, probably even 50, definitely by 100, yeah. um, sales leaders are just completely losing track of what's going on in, in, in the organization. Um, and I think, you know, 
you know, specific to our tool, you know, it, with a sales team of, of maybe 20 people, you can still listen in on sales calls. You can still get a feel for what people are saying, how the calls are going, how the pitch is resonating. But if you have 100 reps, like you really, you know, you really have no idea what's going on out there. So I think that's where AI can help in our area, which is coaching, but also I think with the more predicted analytics piece, trying to marry up those data points and give leaders a, a feel for what's going on, which they just can't get otherwise and they're relying on, on you know, bespoke like, um, word of mouth that's coming up from, from other people in the team. I think it, it's, it is good to have something more reliable than that. Okay, so and like the art, the science, that reminds me of Fanon Patami, who founded Node, who was acquired by, oh, I can't remember what CRM, CRM provider, but she talks about the sciences only because it's the art of the art, the art of um, art of selling. And if I reflect on my recruitment days way back when in a previous life, when sales managers would literally sit next to you live on the call with the headset and kind of listen, and of course you can't do that. You can't do that at scale. So let's then kind of double down on the, the the science aspect which you are focusing on to help um, enable sales leaders, sales enablement leaders uh, do this at at scale. Um, I've had a look at kind of this website. You say you kind of plug into existing um, technology platforms that do the do the call recording. Now, forgive me for my ignorance. I was under the assumption that some of those other brands, which I won't mention, um, kind of did did this so what's what's the secret sauce or what's the different scientific approach dare i say that you you and your team are taking to um a pre-existing challenge that i thought was being served quite well in the market but evidently <laughs> evidently not oh yeah so i think um we yeah so when we look at existing conversation intelligence tools I'm, i've been using them for the last couple of years and and you know we still use them now i think they do um, they are good. Like they serve, they definitely serve a purpose. And and to be clear, you know, our our positioning is that we can actually integrate with them rather than necessarily replace them. But I think the the same problem keeps coming up over and over again when we speak to people using CI tools, and that is that they they're recording all of these calls, but nobody has time to watch them. So um, you've got the call recordings, and they make it a little bit easier to listen in on the calls through the keyword search. So, you know, you could search for a term like pricing or, or something like that, and you can jump to that part of the call. But realistically, um, you still need to watch the whole call to really understand the context of what's going on. If you just jump straight to the pricing conversation without having listened to what happened before, you, you don't really, you don't have enough context to make a judgment there. Um, so at the end of the day, while it makes it easier to search, um, you can watch the calls at 2x speed and things like this, it still requires a human being to sit there and listen to the calls and my experience using it personally and also speaking to our customers is that nobody ever does this. I mean, maybe at best managers might listen to, you know, one call per rep per week. Um, but I think even that's being generous in most cases. Um, and, you know, your average sales rep might be taking, you know, 20 calls if they're an AE and hundreds if they're a BD, an SDR. Um, and, you know, you're getting a very, very small insight to what's going on. So the key difference between CI tools and what we're building is that um, we're using large language models like ChatGPT to actually listen on the call and it understands the context and it can it can actually understand whether the sales rep is following the right process and give them feedback around what went well on the call and what didn't. So basically taking the same role that a manager would do if a manager was listening to a call and filling out a scorecard on how they're performing, um, it basically just does that process of like listening to the call, scoring, scoring off a scorecard and then summarizing at the end around what went well and what it put it. Um, so, that's the main difference between us and existing um, conversation intelligence tools. Is that um, you know we we is that we we're not relying on keyword search. We can actually we're using technology now that can understand. Um, and I think once you've got that and you've got a an AI that's able to listen in on the call, score all of them. What you can do with the data then across all of the calls when you've got the other you know ninety percent of the picture that you didn't have before is also pretty exciting. Like looking at the trends of what are the consistent mistakes a rep is making. Um, what is the you know consistent strengths and weaknesses? How are they improving over time? Um, and then what's kind of separating the high and low performers is going to be the next step we're looking into as well. Um, so on that sounds awesome. And I can absolutely see you know how I mean it, it, as you talk through it, it sounds so blindingly obvious that why well, yeah, this one would um, want to do this and why there's a need for this. How how are you determining kind of what good is from a scientific process perspective or what language models are you using to 
because it's got to have a framework to write to work within right from a context perspective that a this is a sales call for this particular product therefore there are going to be some parameters around um around that so how are you overcoming kind of that because we've discussed that yes sales are sales in its basic in its basic construct but every industry every product every services is going to be nuanced and have kind of those different kind of things which over time as human beings you develop that gut that gut um instinct so how are you kind of how are you getting around that kind of potential challenge or question that you might be getting yeah so we see there is there's two steps to this so the first step when we started first developing the product we basically used ChatGPT for um and you can uh you can basically set up a custom scorecard within the product to prompt it as to what it's going to grade the call on so every organization can set up a custom scorecard um we have templates inside the product around all the key like the biggest methodologies like spin selling solution selling medic challenger yeah. we have as well actually so you, you can actually prompt it to to look you can use a template and you can you can prompt it to look for certain things according to a methodology or you can create your own custom one for the organization and this already does like a, a very good job i would say um to be able to reflect your own sales process and make sure so for the managers they'd be able to check then it's two steps are the sales reps following the right process are they asking the right questions and are they you know making sure that they're following the methodology and then overall you know what are they doing well and what could be improved so we can do that already with a scorecard sitting inside chat um then the second step for us is we're looking into um, open source large language models now as well which would allow companies to train the models based on their own um, individual circumstances so what we can then uh the large language the open source models aren't quite there yet if when we run tests with this we lose some of the quality of the understanding in the transcript so i don't think we're quite there but you know we're quite confident this is going to catch up quickly um and then the idea here would be allowing bigger organizations probably especially to um ingest the data from the transcripts and their call recordings and actually start to train sort of bespoke models that understand their products um their services like we're working with one client who has quite technical industry language um and we need to be able to train it to do that um so that's that will be the second step but i think already what we're able to do with chat gbt with the custom scorecards gets us like, surprisingly far i mean i don't i don't know if you've ever tried but if you go into chat gbt and you ask it to you know what is the challenger sales method or, like model mm -hmm. it's able to describe it quite well and it would also be able to analyze a call transcript with that um, frame mm -hmm. of mind um, and actually be able to make a, some some assessments around whether the person is doing well according to you know a challenger sale um, coach or consultant who is listening to the call so it can do quite well on its own and then once you start you know giving it more specific prompts it can really you can really take it to the next level already Ah, neat. So some of our listeners, if they've got call transcripts, for example, and they've got an open AI, um, you know, chat GPT, I'm guessing chat GPT four is better than the chat GPT three or 3.5. Yeah. They can even potentially analyze a call script against, um, I mean, it's not going to be as sophisticated as where you're at, but at least gives them the sense of, oh, okay, I kind of, I kind of get it. it though you can, if you try it in chat GPT, there's a couple of limitations. First of all, you won't um, there's a character length, which character limit, which is going to mean that you probably can't, you can probably only do sort of a 10 or 15 minute call. Yeah. Um, and second of all, we've done quite a lot of work on the back end in our prompts engineering to make sure that it's, you know, reading the transcripts in the right way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you can definitely get a flavor of it just opening up ChatGPT and giving it a shot. I mean, that's how we started as well. Mm -hmm. I was literally pulling out, um, pulling uh, transcripts out of our conversation intelligence tool, putting them in. And then we just like refined it and then we uh, API and then, yeah, it's, it gives you a flavor, but I think there's still quite a lot of work that's happened in the back end and be able to make it possible. And, and yeah, I'm absolutely not denigrating into <laughs> what, what you're doing, where you're at. It's just more in terms of, I think it gives, it gives people a flavor of kind of, Hey, this is, this is a bit rough and ready, but I kind of, I kind of get it. And then pick up the phone to Bo and have a, um, you know, further, a, a, a further conversation around, around how you might be able to, um, to support so with you know with your existing clients where this is you know i appreciate there's only five months old in terms of the product but with anybody that's kind of using it at the moment what sort of results are they seeing is it too early to say that or are you starting to see you know results in in the field as it were so we still are too early to say in terms of like revenue and conversion rates i think also with our customers um we're getting like good qualitative feedback but um one challenge we're struggling with at the moment is that a lot of 
company's uh, sales results aren't very good for the last two quarters. <laughs> so, so no matter what you do, I think uh, it's hard to find a correlation at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, some of the things that we've seen, like working with um, one customer, we were looking at what, how, so they built out this playbook, they built out the scorecard to see which sales reps are following the playbook and which ones weren't. And one super interesting finding we found with one customer is that their top three performers were not actually following the playbook very well at all compared to some of the bottom performers. So we had lower performers in the team who were actually following the, the playbook more precisely and getting worse results. Um, and I think this was super interesting. Like at first we thought that we were doing something wrong and we had to double check it a few times, but um, already, you know, being able to see that and then, okay, well, what is it that these people are doing differently? Um, and how can we then feed that back in? So we talk about the art versus science. You know, here's a, a good example of, of, you know, these are artists, um, you know, maybe not scientists, and that's that's good for them. But what matters, it doesn't matter if you've got three good performers in a team of 50. You yeah. need to then find out, okay, what can we take away from these calls and we can feed it back into the other 47 people on the team? Um so we can get we can get some of those learnings back in, and some of the stuff they're doing is like natural natural zest and flair, which is hard to replicate. But there there was also some things like in the process that we can build in for the others. Um, so I think this is one of the interesting findings we've had already. But I think for in terms of like revenue outcomes and conversion rates, it's still still too early to tell. We're still in beta. But I think that example you've just given in in orbit itself is is intriguing right because certainly in SaaS world it's the you know that the process is drilled into the reps that you must follow the the process because the process is right if you follow the process and the script all is uh all is well yes and uh, you know it reflects so well so so well back on my uh, my recruitment days which I'll share share in a minute on something on a much much more basic level and I wonder whether those individuals were more experienced. They were in this. They were longer, you know, longer serving within the company. So they were probably using bits of the process that worked. But to your point, over time, they just built that, just that rhythm and that cadence that, that works for them. Because and you can't teach that, right? That takes time and perseverance. And share a story pushing what crikey, fifteen plus, almost twenty years ago in recruitment when we had the Cisco phone systems, then Cisco um, brought out that you could um, report on the length of time that somebody was on a phone call, right? So we started getting these call reports going around all, all the uh, the teams. I used to recruit sales professionals into the IT and tech sector. And there were three of us who were always at the bottom of the length of time total spent on phone. And our director was like, you, you need to get on the phone more. And we're like, why? And he goes, well, you need to, the, the people at the top are on the phone more. I'm like, okay, well, let's look at the revenue boards. <laughs> and of course, the three of us that were always at the bottom were always at the top from a revenue perspective because we we're just having better conversations. I said, we will make yeah. more phone calls if you pay us more commission. If you're not going to pay us more commission, then we're doing what we need to do to do the numbers. And then very quickly, they stopped <laughs> using that as a mechanism to try and get people to do things. They realized just by virtue of the fact that somebody was on the phone more didn't necessarily mean they were having better better yeah, yeah. because they're on the phone more <laughs> so yeah, but I mean, here yeah. we are in 2023 in the world of chat gpt and these kind of similar kind of <laughs> similar themes and challenges are still coming uh coming through which to your point i don't believe are necessarily can be a hundred percent solvable because yes there is the science i think it's awesome that you know you're creating a product that can show these these things to come out i think for me then it's around is the sales manager, sales enablement leader, whomever, are they equipped with enough experience to then understand what to do with this piece of information they're getting and how mm. to use that god awful term pivot? How do we change where the human intervention comes in to actually lift up the people that um, may well be struggling? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is also what we're talking to them. So, for context, the three people who were not following the playbook they were all quite experienced sales reps so i think they were doing a lot of the stuff in grain but they had enough confidence you know they knew the playbook off by heart and it gave them confidence to then then go off the playbook so some of the stuff was is we, we could replicate for the others but some of it's it's not and that's that's okay like the conversation we had with this customer was like you know they know that their playbook isn't perfect but you know the purpose of the playbook is to help is not for the top performers anyway it's for the the new people and the people that are struggling, middle of the pack or the lower performers. And how do you build a playbook that 
a process that you know kind of an average rep can follow that can get them to a you know a b plus player um you know that's the purpose of the playbook like if you if you then start using it to beat the head over the top performing reps and getting them to conform even though like that that's stupid and and i mean you know i it reminds me of the uh the what what a common conversation i have in sales calls for our lms is that so many companies still want to track um how many seconds someone looks at a training how many page views they have on a training and and you know our whole thinking here is like well you know no one ever like we you know companies are using products that do this but no one ever looks at that data or they very rarely do like what we care about what they should care about is like is the person hitting their targets and then if they are nobody cares about whether they did the training or not like you know the less time they spend the training the more time selling the better but I guess it's about having the data that when you do find people who are underperforming, being able to backtrack and work out what went wrong, yeah. like being able to then find the the root cause is is you know where it becomes in where it comes helpful. But yeah, as you said as well, I think that for us, you know, we're definitely not there yet, and I don't think we'll ever be at the point where we'll be able to hundred percent replace the role of a coach or a manager. Um, you know, I think I don't think that sales reps are going to listen to an AI coach enough anyway. I mean, we hear this all the time that we give sales reps feedback and they don't believe it and then then we show then it actually plays in the clip of the call where they said these things and then they go okay well maybe it is true but the first reaction is always to say like stupid ai doesn't know what's going on (laughs) um but uh uh, yeah so i don't think we're going to be able to replace the role of the human but i think we can you know we can hopefully make sure the managers um we can save a lot of time listening to calls we can give them the data they need to be able to understand the strengths and weaknesses of, of a rep. And then I think they will need to reinforce it for the person. Um, and you're right, it does. One risk with this is it is relying on the skills of the manager, whether they are able to interpret this correctly or whether they're going to follow it um, exactly. Uh, but I think, you know, the way with all of this, all of this AI, I mean, especially now it's still too, it's still in its infancy. And I think everything needs to be reviewed and checked and, it can speed a lot of things up, but it's not there to fully replace things yet. Um, you, you, you preempted me on kind of, it's, it's, it's always so cliche to go to it, but the sporting analogy in terms of where sports teams are today across all different types of sport, you know, sports that are out there, how they're using data you know, to track you know, what their players' movements are doing, time on court, speed travel, distance. You look at, I'm a big Formula One fan. I mean, that's just a whole other level of kind of the, 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 the data aspects. And in all of this, that for me is, is, is the linchpin, is the abilities from the human who's looking at that. How does that translate into the real world? And how can I then make that real for the team to then they lift them up and coach them um, coach them them further so you're you know you're very clear that we're in its infancy or five months in 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 terms of your 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 thinking um, in the green room we talked about you know copilot is is coming um i think i saw yesterday that microsoft are now opening up their uh their preview to some a broader a broader audience but kind of copilot to, uh, aside where do you where can you see other applications of this type of thinking in terms of what you're doing where other what other applications might this um translate into and i appreciate that but we're having this this is being recorded on the 4th of july 2023 when this goes out it's probably going to be out of date in terms of our response in terms of in terms of the next iteration of whatever it, whatever it is but uh, to put you on the spot where 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 do you think this this can could should go i don't know yeah, so I mean, I I can't say what is going to happen in the long term, but I can say like two things we're looking at, you know, in the in the medium term that I think is going to be possible in the next year. Um, one thing that you you mentioned about the the sports analogy and and having so many different data points, and you, you alluded to that as well with like kind of over engineering of of sales organizations. Um, you know, one big opportunity I see just from a product development pers- perspective and a UX perspective is is being able to simplify the the UX and the the way that we interact with the software. So, um, you know, I think previously a lot of sales software, you go into the analytics page of the software and there's like a million different charts and graphs and spreadsheets and things you can create. Um, you know, and a lot of our customers as well, no matter how many charts we create, there's never enough. They want to download the, the raw data and they've got a data team working on it. Um, but I think something that, is already becoming possible and will be we'll see more of in the next 12 months is just um having like uh, natural language prompts on on this stuff so 
um, you know, rather than getting every different data point for everyone and trying to figure it out, you could just ask an open text question like, hey, what is separating the, you know, Chris, our top performer from the rest of the team over the last 30 days? Yeah. Um, so being able to ask these questions and get natural responses that sort of smooths out some of these, like all of these conflicting data points and confusion, I think this is going to to change to change a lot in the terms of the way we interact with software. It's going to make it a lot simpler to understand and it's also going to save you a lot of time like digging through. Um, the question then is going to be how do you, how do we, If I, I believe we're going to be able to do it and it's going to be able to produce results, but then how do you make sure that people believe it and, and how do you let, allow people to peel back the onion um, mm-hmm. to give them confidence of, you know, what what is there? That's going to be probably the main challenge to make these, these sorts of things work. So that's one thing we're looking into. The second thing, um, which we touched on, but I, I didn't um, unpack, was the personalization for individual reps. So we talked about like having open source models that we can customize by company, but also eventually building up a coach that understands, you know, the nuances of individual reps, how they like to be given feedback. Do they like it straight up? Do they like it? Um, do they like positive reinforcement. Yeah. Um, you know, being able to uh, something else that we're seeing is I, I talked about how we're seeing a lot of resistance from resistance from reps. So, you know, something that we also know from our training days is that sometimes even if it's the most important skill someone should be working on, they might not be interested in it. And how do you accommodate for this? Um, you know, maybe it's better if they do the second most important thing, if they've got a lot more motivation for that and allowing reps to be able to sort of guard that and, and adjust the the way that model, like the way that the coach is talking to them, the sort of the way it gives feedback, the sort of things it's giving feedback on and eventually kind of understanding them over time is also something that I think we'll see more of in, in the coming, yeah, let's say, I don't think it's going to be, it'll probably be 12 months or so before it gets there, but I think that's the way that it will go um, eventually. So again, coming back to the the first question you asked me about what's the difference between us and conversation intelligence tools is I think, you know, you look at conversation intelligence tools and it's still a lot of like, there's videos in there, people have to watch the videos, there's a lot of data. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's inputting things and outputting things, but I think here having a more tailored experience where you know, it's able to actually understand you and shift the way that you interact with the product between people is, is you know, an opportunity I see for the way that we're building software and the UX that we might see. But uh, again, this is a hope. I know that you're a bit skeptical about some of the stuff that like Microsoft Copilot says that it can do, but I think... Well, it's um, not, <laughs> I'm not saying it's not skeptical. It's just um, they have a very slick marketing machine. And, you know, if... if if it can do, you know, I think even 50% of what they believe it can do um, straight out of the gate, then it, then that's a massive game changer. And you know, for me, and I want to come back to your personalization piece in a minute, but let's 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 build on, on this bit. Is I think once organizations start turning this technology in on themselves and they feel comfortable they're doing it in a secure environment and they feel comfortable that they can start to interpret their data in their own, you know, in their own way. You know, Excel, for example, what's the latest forecast on this? Or can you change this? And imagine you then start to bring voice in. You just talk to your computer and, and you get these uh, these new responses. I think that we're we're in for a wild ride over the next five years and certainly 10 years. And I've got an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, so God knows what kind of world they're going to they're grow up. And back to the personalization piece. Um, I don't know if you have, um, if you use Spotify as your um, your kind of listening platform of uh, of, of choice, but um, I've now got the AI DJ, so DJ Xavier or DJ DJ X, as as he introduced or they introduced themselves as. It's insane. It is utterly insane in terms of what they've done. Is gone back through the entire library of music you've ever listened to. And then they create an AI radio DJ for you. But the insanity of it is they then acquire a voice, a text to voice um, organization. So it sounds like a human being, how they interact with you and how they then queue up the next songs like, hey, you may not remember, but you listened to these three songs back in 2016. Here are the three songs. And they play and you're like, holy shit, this is just and the emotional kind of attachment you then make. Because like, oh, my God, I, I did listen to that song back in 2016. And that song's really, really cool. And then it goes in. And because you're listening to this type of music, I'm going to try you with these types of music. But if you don't like it, just let me know through the app in terms of in terms of this. So until until that moment, I didn't really believe that you could truly do personalization at scale. But for me, Spotify had kind of shown what can be done when, A, I think you trust the brand. 
and you have yeah. that trust relationship between the the brand and then b uh, they of course have really really good data on on its 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 users so i think the challenge will be is the as a as a say as a person as an employer i don't think this necessarily even needs to be a salesperson how comfortable are you going to be in terms of hang on a second what is it the co- why does the company feel like it knows more about me than I know about my myself? And this is this is nothing new. I think it was Hewlett Packard back in early two thousands, possibly or maybe mid mid two thousands, when they were starting to analyze employee flight risk and could work out which employees were going to basically leave based on varying things, and then could work out and point the managers at which ones they didn't want to leave versus the ones that okay, your natural uh, your natural churn. And that was you know, shut down pretty quickly. So I've I've seen what I believe to be the future in the consumer space. I would like to believe that we can get to where your vision is in the B2B space, but I question whether as an employee, one would feel initially comfortable. And, you know, talking on Microsoft, this is what Viva and Viva Insights is kind of, is all about. And there's already kind of, you know, very, very careful, well, hang on a second, I, you know... <laughs> I'm not feel comfortable about this, but um, what? Yeah, so that's just my viewpoint on that. There's no real question there. My no. my, my thoughts. But I think that, I think you 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 bang on that it, it will come down to the sensitivity of the data. So like with Spotify, um, if if Spotify makes the wrong song recommendation, it doesn't really matter. You just click next. Yeah. Um, if you're relying on AI to hire and fire people, then there's a bit higher consequences for that. So I think it will it will come down. It will come down to this. I mean, I feel like you know now we're in the sales coaching space. We're giving feedback to people. Um, I feel like this is enough. We're not we're not telling people. We're not pointing out like people that are bad or good. We're, we're just we're giving feedback to perhaps trying to help them. I feel like this is probably a safe space that people are comfortable to take the recommendations. But it will always require um, a human to check it as well. And I think the more yeah, the more. The bigger the implications of the decisions, um, then then the more checks and balances we'll need. Um, so I think you know, especially talking about large corporate organisations um, using Microsoft Pilot and things like this, um, I think a lot of companies will use it to as a starting point for their decision making. So they'll use it as an input. Um, it will help them narrow down a space or or act as a sparring partner. Um, but then they'll always want to you know peel back the onion to understand what data is sitting under that. And they'll want to sense check it themselves before they they make any decisions. But I think that's what makes it easier for you know Spotify to be able. We'll probably see bigger bigger improvements here in the in the consumer space. Um, also, you talk about you know what makes us different the conversation intelligence tools. Like what we're doing right now, especially in the early stages, the early tests with ChatGPT. As you also pointed out, you can just copy and paste the transcript into ChatGPT. So I think these early stages, there isn't anything defensible about this. So I, I also question why isn't Gong and Chorus doing this as well? But I think they just have more more to lose here in terms of getting yeah. it, it wrong. Um, and you know, there's probably going to be a little bit. They're going to be a little bit more sensitive, dipping their toes in, as it's one of the benefits of a small company um, that we can you know play with something in, in beta and bring our first customers on. And and you'll probably see this as well coming from. On one hand, the big companies have all the power because they've got the big data sets, but they've also got more ethical you know yeah. then they've got more more limitations here because i think smaller startups will have more freedom to play working with the customers that are comfortable you know working with something in its infancy um before it becomes more mainstream so that will probably also be something we'll see in terms of how and when these these things will be rolled out across different software um i think that's a good place to end for today Bone, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on as a guest. If people want to find you and uh, learn more about what you and your awesome team can do for them in the world of AI-led sales, uh, real-time sales uh, coaching, where's the best place for them to reach point them to? LinkedIn, if you want to reach out to me personally, or our website, so um, wonderway.io uh, is the best place. Um, in, you can Thanks. check out the products and... Links Thanks down below. I'm getting this YouTube thing now. Hit smash the subscribe button. I'm getting down with the uh, getting down with the kids on that. <laughs> so if you're listening on the um, uh, listening on the audio, all the links will be in the um, uh, in the audio description. Is uh, uh, the summary description? Get it. Get real, Alex, um, on all of this. And if you have listened to this and you have, um, you know, do mention that to Burn when you uh, 
when you reach out that you, you've had a listen so they'll know where you're at in terms of your uh, your thinking but Ben it's an absolute uh, pleasure great to have you on the show and I look forward to following your journey with intrigue to see where you uh, to see where you end up thanks Alexander it's been awesome and as always to my guests thank you so much for tuning in you know what to do if you want to be on the podcast hit me up if you want to recommend somebody to be on the podcast hit me up wherever you are in the world um, have a good one and I'll catch you all next time <laughs>